Hello and welcome. My name is Susan Ma, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, before we begin, I, would, of course, would like to start with an acknowledgement that um, we are, this event is taking place on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh Tooth First Nations, and to extend appreciation to our Indigenous hosts for the opportunities to continue learning, building friendships, and community together. One of the things we learned, sorry, why am I, yeah, I don't need to, I realize, it's so second nature. Uh, I was like, why do I sound muffled? Uh, one of the things we learn uh, and are reminded about from the First Nations is the great importance of storytelling. How telling your story can be healing, um, how listening to one can inspire you and move you in ways that are sometimes even out of body, and how stories carry the power to transform by connecting something inside us to something beyond ourselves. Uh, in, and in particular today, we'd like to celebrate oral stories, uh, which is really what this event is all about. Um, personally, and I, I'm seeing some faces that I feel like it was just yesterday, but it's been over two years. Um, I've so missed, I'm sure so many of you have, these opportunities, these acts of gathering in our community spaces to be together, to meet each other, uh, and to share our stories. Um, being hunkered down during the pandemic, uh, and I had a newborn, so maybe I was, um, my hermitage was perhaps even more extreme. Um, I haven't started gathering, so this for me is a first, and it's really nice to be able to speak to adults and not have to say, no, no pushing. <laughs> I was like, how do I talk to people again? <laughs> so this is a good practice for me. Um, but uh, I realize, you know, as we open up to post-pandemic life, um, how precious these in-person moments are. And I know that, you know, not everybody still has that privilege. Um, and, you know, with all due respect, we want to appreciate uh, everybody's comfort level. But also then thank you for coming today uh, and being with us in this afternoon to share stories and um, to participate in our first Pacific Canada Story Fest. Um, we'd also like to thank... Um, actually quite a few people, uh, our speakers, um, who I will, you know, I'm, I'm looking very much forward to introducing shortly, um, but also the team that helped put this together, all the people that were involved. Um, you know, we all had to sort of dust off our, our event planning and organizing uh, selves. And so um, in particular, I wanted to thank the team of directors, uh, advisors, youth ambassadors, and staff that make up the Pacific Canada Heritage Center Museum of Ma uh, Migration or PCHC, M-O-M for short, or PCHC for even shorter. Um, there's a lot of you, uh, and you all run on something. I don't know what it is, but you are tireless and ambitious. Um, and some of you are here today. Um, and so please give a little wave if I call you. Um, past presidents, Tanika Helwig and Winnie Chung, who also founded the organization there. And where's Winnie? There's Winnie, yay. Yeah. Current President Wendy Yip, the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> Board Directors Ada Khan, uh, Taran Singh Dillon, Stan DeMello. Stan, where are you? Because you had a big role to play in all of this. Oh, he's still cleaning up the food. Stan DeMello, there he is. Yes, thank you, Stan. And Pat Perungao. Pat, I saw, there you are, Pat, our lovely Pat. And I believe Henry Yu will be uh, joining us at some point. No, did he just arrive? So Henry's here, Professor Henry Yu, of course. Uh, Andy Pham, very nice to meet you. <laughs> the correspondence in Sesame Great. Um, there's also honorary advisors, Tama Capathorn and Patsy George are here with us today. Yes, lovely, thank you. And of course, a lot of our feet on the ground, the youth ambassadors, Patara McKean, Katra Daryabi, yeah, and Samantha Matute, she's taking the photos there in the corner, Gavin Boyd, Rihanna Lal, Mahima Sharma, and Liz Tsui. Yeah, they're all here, thank you. We have a couple of, and, and sorry? Katra, I did, yes. Katra, but Katira uh, by another name. Um, we also have administrative assistant Albert Chen and event coordinator Sophie Monk. Thank you so much. And did I miss anybody else? No? Okay. Henry, Henry just arrived. Great to see you, Henry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, and almost everyone I listed is a volunteer. So they're very passionate and absolutely tireless. I don't know how they do what they do. 
Um, but we also want to thank a few other people, um, the AV tech team, Elwyn, Fana, and Lucas. You guys are, um, you know, uh, Absolutely fantastic, thank you. And of course, Angela Clark and the Italian Cultural Center for collaborating with us and the use of this beautiful space. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are Paul, uh, Paul Ewan and Kathy Lee here today? Yes, thank you so much for your continued support from Bodwell High School. Um, and finally, we gratefully acknowledge the financial support of the province of British Columbia for this festival as well. Um, my friend Winnie Chung will speak shortly about PCHC and why we do what we do, but before that I just wanted to uh, address two last practical matters. The first is the washrooms. If you haven't had a chance to determine where they're located, they're just out these doors and immediately to your left at the start of the hallway here. Um, please feel free to use them when the occasion calls. Uh, and documentation. Uh, we are documenting this event through photography. Uh, and the stories are primarily through video. If you do not wish to be photographed, however, please inform our photographer, that's Samantha over there, uh, or our event coordinator, Sophie Monk, who's just outside. Um, so all right, I'd like to ask Winnie Chung, our past president and founding member of PCHC, but current mentor, advisor, behind the scenes magic worker, to share some words about the organization. Okay. So I would not stand between you and this fantastic story speak, uh, storytellers. So I try to be brief, but I do want you to remember that when we started this whole project, our intention is to really build a physical museum so that we have a physical hub where we can explore our multicultural stories together because Canada is really about this great experiment that we have that we bridge those gaps, we get to know each other and recognize how great we are when we have the strength of diversity. So uh, without saying too much, I just want to share a piece of exciting news. This is, I think, on Monday, um, down south, they are ahead of us again. President Biden and Vice President actually signed an act, and that act is to look into building a museum, a national museum of Asian Pacific American history and cultural act. So it's now an act. So Canada, we have to work harder to be ahead of them, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. It's always such a great reminder about how important it is to provide these platforms for these stories to be shared, uh, for us to connect with each other, um, and such vision for the Museum of Migration. Um, I would also like to just, you know, you're here to hear the stories, um, and so I, we have five speakers in our circle today with five very diverse presentations, um, from personal journeys to family histories, uh, migration stories to stories hidden in our very own communities and how to capture those. I'd like to introduce each one at a time, uh, and we'll hear from all five before opening up at the end for uh, sharing quest asking questions, sharing thoughts, and uh, having a conversation as well. Um, and very, first, I would like to introduce uh, Marguerite Gisleri, who is a lifelong Vancouverite uh, that has traveled the world and led many groups across the globe. She is an advocate and active member in the Italian Canadian community and has become a memory keeper of her family's stories. So, thank you, Marguerite. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, as well as the other storytellers. I haven't met you yet, but I look forward to doing so after we've all had our turn. It's a perfect Vancouver day to be inside for storytelling. <laughs> My appreciation to Susan and Angela for inviting me to join in this storytelling event. Welcoming all of you back after not being able to meet for the last two years due to the pandemic. My name is Marguerite O'Donoghue Gislieri. And with my ancestry being Irish, French, and English, I was born here in Vancouver at St. Paul's Hospital, and I have many brothers and sisters, all also born in Vancouver. But enough about me. I met my husband, Mario Anthony Gislieri, in 1959, and we were married for 53 years before he passed away seven years ago. He was also born in Vancouver at St. Paul's Hospital, but of Italian parents. His mother was born in Vancouver of Italian parents, and his father was born in Alexandria de Salé, 
Piedmont, Italy. His mother's maiden name was Barazal, and this large book was put together by a few of his cousins that traces the Barazal's extended history for many, many, many years. I brought this book as an example of what families can do. And at the end, I will be putting all the material that I brought along the back counter there so people can look at them if you'd like. Today, it's my pleasure to reminisce about my husband's father's life. His side of the family's ancestors were noble and renowned family living in Italy. In their history is a good pope in the mid-1500s, Pope Pius V, a Marquis uh, Grazzamo Filippo Ghislieri of a Stefano, as well as a marvelous religious painter named Bonaparte Ghislieri of the 16th century. His works are in the British Museum. The card that I have displayed in the front there is one of his works and shows the minute details of religious paintings he was known for. Napoleon actually stayed at the family's villa in Italy a couple of occasions when he visited there. Fred, my husband's father, and his brother Herman were born in Italy, as well as their sister Gabriella. Their father, Mario Sr., had a thriving, uh, uh, excuse me, a thriving vineyard and winery, as well as property in Italy, and was a highly educated man. He also had a construction business in Italy. He was a former officer in the Italian army during the First World War and a very good organizer and speaker. He was assigned as a border guard between Switzerland and Italy during his time in the army. He was known as an honest person and highly thought of in the business world and community in Italy. However, their business and property was flooded out when the Po River overflowed its banks during a terrible, terrible flood, and the family decided it was time to leave Italy, and they packed up what they could take in hand-carried luggage and immigrated to Canada. When they arrived in Canada, they went first to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and bought property and farmed. Once again, they had to move because of the drought, which made the prairies a dust bowl. So in 1934, they set off for Vancouver, and the car was driven by Herman, who was only 16 at the time, a teenager without a driver's license, and he had to drive through the Canadian Rockies. Quite a feat at that time for a young man, but very, very scary for the family. Once again, they started a new style of life, this time in the wonderful city of Vancouver, British Columbia. Mario Sr. had a thriving construction business, and in my past, on numerous drives around the city with friends, I have pointed out various buildings and things he supervised the building of, apartments, water fountains, and church rectories, to name a few. Mario Sr. was active in the Italian community's social life in Vancouver and was the pre-war president of the Vancouver Italian-Canadian Mutual Aid Society and a leading spokesperson for the Italian Veterans Association. He soon became involved in the Cercola Giulio Giordani, the youth organization of the VICMA. Because of Mario Sr.'s involvement with the youth group, he signed up Herman as a gymnastic instructor, Fred as the secretary, and Gabriella as the undersecretary. They themselves had not signed up for the club. <laughs> Italian lessons were also given at the club. The involvement with these specific clubs led to the day when the RCMP Plains Clothes police officers arrived at their home on Francis Street at Victoria Drive, in 1940, the house is still there, and picked the men up unceremoniously. Anna, my husband's sister, still remembers that day. The two government men walking up their sidewalk 
and uninvited went in and demanded Fred and Herman come with them. Mario Sr. was picked up at work. The three of them were taken to the immigration building at the foot of Burrard Street. There, they were kept behind bars in overcrowded conditions on the top floor, not knowing what they were being held for. When they were finally moved three weeks later, on a very hot summer day, they were placed on a CPR train, chained to their seats for a portion of the trip, and were sent on the train to seek Alberta, where they transferred to army trucks for the final leg of their journey to Kananaskis, Alberta, where a POW camp was located. Already at the camp were German, German Canadians, Ukrainians, and Italians. Their families did not know where they were for about three to four weeks. For many, the time at the camp was like a great, big, happy picnic, and even like a camping holiday. The days were spent playing soccer, Italians versus Germans, of course, <laughs> and internees had a variety of camp duties to keep themselves busy. The internees kept the huts, usually 18 to 20 persons per hut, clean, did kitchen duties, cut wood in the surrounding forest, clean the campsite, etc. Internees also took part in arts and craft programs, of which I have a few sample of the artifacts to show you. They're uh, along the back on the counter, which you could take a look at later. Different internees had various skills, so there was often trading going back and forth but a number of artifacts the Ghislieri family have given to or loaned to the Italian Cultural Center's museum are mostly items made by Fred. These articles are much valued by the family and the items shown today include a wood burning showing the campsite of Kananaskis, a wood carving of Chief Kananaskis, wood frames for pictures, and a cartoon of the campsite showing various activities, jokes, and the uniform, which actually hangs in our kitchen. Other artifacts our family have given to the museum are unfortunately behind the walls because of the current displays, but include a charcoal drawing of Fred, a wood carving of Mary, the side profile of her face, a macrame belt and bone belt buckle Fred made for Mary, a copy of the cartoon picture, more frames, a cigarette box, and a POW handmade Christmas postcard addressed to Mrs. Mary Gislieri, Fred's mother, excuse me, Fred's wife. These artifacts were not seen by Fred's children, Anna and Mario, until they found uh, them during their teenage years in a suitcase stuck on a far shelf in their home's wine cantina. <laughs> they opened the suitcase and found a treasure trove, so of course asked their mother what all this was. Fred and Mary never talked about what they were and where they had been made. So they, packed the, uh, they explained things to the children and then they packed them back up and we didn't see them until they were selling their home. Fred never did any crafts or arts when he returned home from the camps. I say camps because the camp in Kananaskis became a German POW camp and the Italians and other non-Germans were moved by train across Canada to Petawawa in Ontario. This camp was located close to the military base of the same name and was located about a hundred 160 kilometers north of Ottawa. Mario Sr. was one of the longest internees at Cap Petawawa. Fred and Mary never talked about Fred's time in the camps and were always very private people. They never went to social events other than with the few people they were comfortable being with. Humiliation at the injustice done to Fred Herman and Mario Sr. clouded their entire lives. 
as well as their families' lives. I know from conversations with different people that life in the camps were like a holiday, as mentioned earlier. Whereas many people don't realize the terrible, terrible times the wives and families left behind had to endure. My husband's mother, Mary, a Canadian citizen born in Vancouver, had to travel by streetcar from East Vancouver all the way to 3rd and 3rd, 33rd and Canby Street once a month with two babies in tow to check in with the RCMP at the headquarters in the Tudor-style building on 33rd Avenue between Canby and Oak. This in itself was, to me, a great misuse of the power on the part of the government. Absolutely no help was given to Mary or other wives of the internees by the government. So Mary and her young sister-in-law had to work as waitresses to support her mother-in-law, sister-in-law, two small children and herself while Fred was interned. Many businesses were lost. Wives and mothers had serious medical issues. Children had to be raised by relatives and no compensation or monetary assistance was offered. Lives were never the same when the internees returned. Their families had suffered greatly while they were away. And up until about 15 or 20 years ago, many did not talk about it. Most of the internees have now passed away and did not receive an apology before their passing. However, my compliments go out to Mr. Raymond Koulos, as he has done an absolutely superb job of writing the history of the Italian, Italian Canadians in Vancouver and British Columbia. He did write two volumes of very special books. I have brought one of my own to show, and it will be on the back. He has also done an exceptional job of writing about the Italian internees during World War II. The book is called Injustice Served. For this, I personally thank him. Many of you might know that finally, in May of this year, after years and years of procrastination, the federal government, with just a few sentences, verbally apologized for the detainment of these men, way too late for most of them, with words of little substance. These men that were interred were never charged with anything. However, a couple of weeks ago here at the Italian Community Center, a very well-worded, articulated, and exceptionally well-offered apology from the city of Vancouver was given during the celebration of Italian Heritage Month. Just before the apology, an outstanding address was given by Mr. Koulos, who told it exactly like it was for the men, wives, and families who were affected by the internment of so many good, hardworking, and honest individuals of Italian ancestry. History is a special source of life to be savored and enjoyed by generations of now and in the future. So talk to your elders, your siblings, your extended family members, and get your own family histories down. Some will be sad. Some will be happy. Some will have areas that can't be filled personally, but can be filled in with other person's memories. Your future generations will definitely wish to know more of their past. It is better you set the record straight, as unfortunately the media plays a big role in what is put out into print. It is a shame that the Vancouver Sun or other local media, as far as I know, were not in attendance at the Italian Heritage Celebration a few weeks ago, as any reporter would have had a very, very good story for the people of Vancouver and British Columbia. 
The representatives from the city of Vancouver came with the proclamation of the month of June as the Italian Heritage Month was well received. This was followed by their exceptional apology to the attorneys and then the introduction of some of the attorney family members as most attorneys have now passed away, as I mentioned. It was a very emotional time for many of us and very well received. The written word, and in turn the spoken word, plays a very big role in our lives. And when misinformation is given, it's remembered, sometimes over the truth. As an example, prior to May's federal apology in reference to the attorneys, in a letter to the editor of the Vancouver Sun, a writer said, no apology should be given as the attorneys were all fascist. This could be no further from the truth as such was not the case in regards to Mario's dad and uncle and also his grandfather. As they had come to Canada in the mid thirties, the two boys were teenagers and only belonged to the club because their father put their names on the club registration and then they helped him run it. They had no political involvement in any fascist party, period. This person who wrote the letter should read Mr. Raymond Kulas' books. He needs to know more about the people interned in their families. Remember, as the stories of our histories are shared, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to pass on this knowledge to our children and grandchildren to be passed along to future generations. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing me the privilege of being here on this exceptional day of storytelling. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you so much, Marguerite. Um, it's a great reminder, you know, this, um, we have a history of even forced migration within our borders and, you know, apologies are coming. They're coming a little late. Well, quite late, I should say. But um, and it's the start of something and that reminds us that there's much work to be done. Um, and something else that, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of things that really stood out to me is that also that, um, that responsibility um, that you carry so magnificently with this, um, the role of being that story keeper. You know, it also comes with inherited trauma as well. So you share, you keep your family's stories, and that's important. It's important work, but it does come with, you know, uh, a weight on your shoulders as well. Um, for myself, it really resonated with me, as, especially as I got older. It was um, became more and more important for me as well to learn more about my family's history and their stories. And it's rife with trauma um, and not easy to talk about, um, but so important to try to understand. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Marguerite. Thanks, Owen. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Quinn Lee. Quinn Lee was born in Vietnam and inexplicably lost her sight at the age of two. Like many of the thousands that fled her war-torn country in the 1980s, Quinn and her family made a harrowing journey across the Pacific to finally arrive in Canada. Today, she is a professional therapist, living her dream and helping others as well. Quinn. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Oh, great. I am really honored to be able to be here and speak to you today. And it's such a wonderful group of people. And because I don't see you, it was kind of really great to hear different names that Susan mentioned. So that's really uh, helpful. And you know, I've been allotted to have 10 minutes to speak to you today. So we'll see whether I can do that. And my question is, can you change your life in 10 minutes? Or can you change someone else's life in 10 minutes? And so today, I want to share with you a story about how 10 minutes can change a person's life and then many people's lives after that. So I'd like you to imagine this image. It was a very hot day. One day, uh, exactly 30 years ago, 1992. 
A very hot day on an island in Indonesia where thousands of Vietnamese boat people lived there in the refugee camp. The temperature was 40 degrees Celsius and it was 12 o'clock when the sun was at the hottest in the day. A mother was walking with her 12-year-old blind daughter. The mother looked very sad, very hopeless, very dejected. The blind daughter could even sense her mother's sadness, so she started to feel hopeless herself. That blind child was me. And so seeing that my mom was sad, a very kind friend invited us into a restaurant to have lunch. So if you could imagine, if you're hungry every day, that would have been a special treat. But my mom was too sad to eat, um, too hopeless to care. And so she said, no, thank you. And up until that point, my family, my mom, my sister and I, were living in that refugee camp for almost four years. Every day, we starved. Every day, we hoped, we waited. Waited for a brighter day when we could leave this foreign place, a place away from home, a place where there was no privacy, no well, little dignity, and ongoing starvation. Yet, we risked our lives to come to that refugee camp. When I was a child, we were in prison once because fleeing from Vietnam was illegal. And we had to travel on a small rickety boat with 100 uh, other people just crowded on a boat and just sit very close together. We were lost in the sea for 10 days. We endured hunger, seasickness, thirst, even pirates attack. We thought that we were not going to make it. We thought we were going to die. But miraculously, we survived. But yet on this day, on this day, we felt more hopeless than ever. Why? Because we were told that our family was not qualified as refugees. That meant that eventually we would have to go back to Vietnam, a place where we tried so hard to escape. And so it seems like all of our hopes and dreams uh, would never come true. And so I, I felt sad, just like my mom. I felt like we were like giving up. And so I started to become sick and, and quite weak, almost like fainted. And I'm not sure whether because, because the heat, it was the heat stroke, or whether because I was just too hopeless to want to do anything. But you know what? In that moment, a car was driving towards us. And um, usually we would ignore these cars because they belong to very important people. But uh, because my mom panicked, so I was sick, she panicked. So, you know, people here who have children would know, right? When, you're, when your children are sick, you, you panic. So she waved at the car, and then the car drove on. And so we thought, oh, you know, just hopeless again. But we weren't surprised. And yet, a few minutes later, the car came back and stopped for us. And so excited, I rushed into the car. And you know, as a blind child, I've never seen a car before. I'd never been in a car before. So I rushed in and I bumped my head like, <clears throat> like this. And um, so if you imagine, I was sick. I was sort of like in a daze. But my mom whispered something that sort of like jolted me out of my sickness. She said, it's Peter. Well, right away, I knew who Peter was. You know who he was? He was the head of all the lawyers who represented the United Nations. He was, he was known to be pretty cold, pretty strict, and pretty tough. But 
they make decisions about who could be refugees and who could be not. And so it was like a light bulb that went off in my head. I thought that was a, a golden opportunity for me to do something about it. I, I, maybe I could change my life. Maybe I could change my family's life. And um, as a blind child, 12 year old, I was quite timid. Right? And I was told not to speak to adults without being spoken to. It's kind of ironic that I'm standing here speaking to you. Uh, but I, I, you know, so in my, in my um, so I gather up all my courage and I decided to speak to him in my broken English. My English wasn't like this now. And so I said to him, I am pointing at my eye. I said, I am blind. Uh, please help me. And so in that moment, something touched his heart, I think, even though he was known to be quite tough. He didn't say much. He asked, you know, what ha where we were going, and I told him about our sad news, uh, not having refugee status. And the only thing he did was he took down my family's uh, ID number. That's it. That's all he did. So I thought that he would forget about us. But the next day, he called us in and told us he overturned the decision. That meant that we could be official refugees because we were asylum seekers at that time. And that's a miracle that never happened before. So what would happen if my mom accepted the friend's offer to eat? We would have totally missed the car. But right? how many times in our lives when we would say yes to good things momentarily and miss life-changing opportunities? What happened if my mom didn't wave at that car? Or what happened if I didn't speak up to ask for help because of being too sick or too shy or thinking that what's the point? And what happened if he didn't do anything? Because you know, he was in the position of privilege. He was a lawyer, he was Dutch, he was uh, Caucasian. I was just a blind child. I didn't even have an ID number. I only have my family's ID number. I was a blind child. And if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be standing here speaking to you today. And so many times I wish that I could meet him and thank him for what he did on that faithful day. Because he opened his heart, because he had compassion for me and my family, we were able to come to Canada shortly after that. And then a year after that, my dad could join our family. A few years after that, my younger sister was born here in Canada. Several years after that, my nieces and nephew uh, were born here in Canada. So you could see, like, he changed my life, my family's life, and family's generations to come. And as a therapist, uh, I've worked with thousands of people for the last 12 years or so. I would like to think that I've changed many people's lives. My, my clients often tell me things like, Quinn, you are my lifesaver. Or Quinn, you have saved my son's life, my daughter's life, my mom's life. So have you not been present in your life? Have you been sleeping? away in your life and not noticing wonderful people around you, wonderful opportunities around you? Or have there been times when you felt too sick, too hopeless, thinking that what's the point, right? Well, the point is you. The point is your life. The change begins with you, with you. And so wake up to your own courage. Be present and notice people around you. Do something in your life. Perhaps one of the stories or all of the stories can change your life today in 10 minutes, however, how many minutes you need. They say that when we liberate ourselves, we liberate other people. 
Or you could be the loyal character in another person's life. You know, the fact that we live here in Canada puts us in the position of privilege, right? So give out your hand to hold someone else's hand or to lift them out of their dark pit. Or open your heart to empower others from a place of love and compassion so you too can change your life in 10 minutes. You too can change someone else's life, many people's lives in 10 minutes. So thank you so much for listening to my story. It really, this idea of the moment, uh, and here we are in a moment, and the rippling effect of all of this, and the resonating power of sharing a story, and for us to witness such storytelling as well. It's powerful, and it sends waves out. So it's exactly what we celebrate. We celebrate your journey, and thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Katra Daryabi. She is hope, resilience, and vision personified. <laughs> Having arrived as a young refugee to Canada and overcoming many obstacles, she shares her story with others and is dedicated to advocating on behalf of threatened women, silenced Afghan, and refugee voices. She is a youth ambassador with PCHC and was recently awarded the City of Vancouver's Award of Excellence in the category of diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much. Honestly, I'm so blown away with those stories that I just forgot that I still have a story to tell, <laughs> let alone the other two. Uh, thank you so much for those inspiring story. I'm so touched and beyond inspired that I cannot put in words. Um, so I thought about what a story to tell, I mean, my story, and I was not sure about anything. And I decided to tell you the truth and ask you to please do not make me nervous or else I would need to use washroom right immediately on my lap, as Susan mentioned. Um, so I'll tell you the truth today about my story. My name is Khatra. I was born and raised in Afghanistan. I was born as a girl. My mother called me parrot because I strive to paint the dance of hope and sing the songs of resiliency and woman empowerment. I was not born a privileged person. I spent the last 18 years fighting to be able to stand here strong and tell you or ask you to hear the, the, woman at Afghan, the pains of Afghan women from me. I became so independent in, in grade five and worked as a radio podcaster for five years to help my parents to pay for my school tuition. I was thinking to myself, I'm a grown up I do not need to ask them for allowance. <laughs> I grew up in the, most, in the Hazara most populated area, and in the last few years, we slept and woke up with bombs exploding over our heads. My dad drove us to school every day to ensure that we fulfilled all our learning opportunities by going to school every day, because Afghanistan's future was in our hands. But my society constantly reminded me with sexual harassment, oppressing my rights, and taking my educational opportunity that I am not enough. According to them, my, my job was dreaming of finding a husband my grandpa's age, learning how to raise children, and cook delicious food to earn the husband's satisfaction. I was lucky to have a family and a resilient parents who had my back. But because of the very oppressive environment in Afghanistan, I have always wanted to be a boy. Still, I learned to say no and accept the heavy consequences. Because no is not an answer anymore. It is an opportunity for us to welcome change in my community, in our community, and empower women and this time to be proud a girl and say, my name is Khatra and I am an Afghan woman leader. I will never forget it. I was threatened by acid, sexual harassment, threatening letters, 
seeing my name on the walls and their efforts to bomb my school and my parents and so on. But I learned to believe I am a beautiful, empowered and resilient leader to create change. I will stand here strong, tell every little girl in the world to get loud and never back down from bringing light to injustice, inequality, and the wars that are displacing millions of people around the world, including my family. My dad always empowered us and treated my mom as if she was the king and he was the queen. When I become, when I asked him to purchase me a bike, he was so happy, even though he knew he was taking the risk of losing me forever because I was committing the crime to bike to school. My mom is a stubborn, resilient, and a true role model for her children. Every time I fail and get disappointed that change is impossible, she says, if you want an easy way out, if you, or if you want an overnight opportunity to change the society, then you're not the strong woman leader Afghanistan needs. My mother never had the chance to go to school and my dad studied until grade six. They mentored my, sib sib my six siblings and I to believe in humanity, have morality, and be unafraid to be loud, and use my voice in any way I can. I live with those voices every day in my head. When I left for the US and New York in 2018, I took three pants and five shirts in my luggage with three books. No one dared to say goodbye. We split with the hope of reuniting again in the next couple of weeks. My mom promised to guard my bike until I return. But things have changed, and a couple of weeks turned to four years of longing. During these four years, I have achieved, learned, explored, learned to speak better English, graduated from high school, got accepted to all four prestigious universities with full scholarship, received awards, and given a TED Talk. I grew up in the absence of having a childhood or having my family to celebrate my success or failure with me. It was a challenging journey. I cannot tell you enough about every night of nightmares I had, loneliness or missing my parents. I still do have the 14-year-old child inside me, craving to hold my mom tight and never let go. When the Taliban took over Kabul, I could not get out of my room. I was locked. I felt unsafe as I thought I was in Afghanistan and the Taliban were shooting at me. This time, all those nightmares came true. My parents luckily burned all the documents, buried our books and photos and time, and made it to Pakistan. Today, my dream is a reunion with my family and freedom from not worrying about their safety. Throughout this harrowing journey, I learned three important lessons that I would like to share with you. First, it is my responsibility not to be quiet because silence means agreeing with the unjust violence and displacements of millions of people around the world who are choosing survival over home. Second, I learned to declare and value the importance of kindness, inclusivity, and compassion. It is a reminder that we are always stronger and better together. We are a country made of immigrants and refugee, and that's who we are. Third, do not give up, because a true leader and a warrior never gives up, despite the struggles, the crying parties, and the disappointments. I'll leave you to reflect on my last sentence. This is my story. What's your story? Thank you. Thank you so much, Katra. Um, you have such a light about you and such amazing leadership. Um, you empower others when you speak. I hope my son grows up to be like you. 
Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Katra has an incredibly inspiring uh, TED Talk. Uh, it's called Educating Girls and Breaking Barriers is What Afghan Women Do. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's a TEDx uh, UBC talk. Um, watch it. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Pakistan-born, Vancouver-based author Tariq Malik. He works across poetry, fiction, and art to distill immersive and original narratives that respond to the world in flux around him. His working English is a borrowed tongue inflected with his inherited languages of Punjabi, Urdu, and Hindi. He came reluctantly late to these shores, having had to first survive three wars, two migrations, and two decades of slaving in the Kuwaiti desert. Please, Tariq, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming here. I'd also like to thank PCHC and the Museum of Migration and the Italian uh, Cultural Center for this opportunity. And thank you all for coming in, although there's a lot happening outside, but you choose to be here. So here we go. Um, Magritte, uh, Quinn and uh, Khatira, thank you so much for your presentation. They're all inspiring, they embody resilience and uh, display how you have overcome challenges and circumstances beyond your control. I shall try to focus on what my personal experience has been in standing here before you by reciting uh, three or four poetry because uh, that's my living now, and uh, it's very central, the way I express myself. So I shall read a couple of uh, poems. Um, I'll begin with uh, recognizing that this is a time that was uh, 100 and, uh, in, uh, sorry, in 1914, when the Komagata Maru ship came here from India, it was this time that it was anchored in Coal Harbor. So it's very much every year when this time comes around from 23rd May to 23rd July, the 60 days, I mark in my mind. And uh, my second book, which was a novel called Chanting Denied Shores, uh, was about that incident. And uh, it remains very much forefront in my mind, the first poem I'm going to read is called X Marks the Spot. And X here is the spot in Coal Harbor on May 23rd, 1914, uh, where Kumagata Maru was anchored and not allowed, the, the passengers were not allowed to land in Canada, although they were all British citizens. Cartographer, cartographic Dotted lines connect point A to point B, point A in Punjab to point B in Vancouver, Canada, 15,000 miles apart. Now only 1,500 impossible feet away the shore. And point X, from midstream stranded ship to beckoning shore, was that on any map? factored in some overlooked equation, marking the point of isolation, exhaustion, and midstream exclusion. X marks the spot where a battle cry once echoed, where rust bled into water and interlaced with salt. X marks the spot where grown men wept for the soil beneath their feet. Yearning, the deck heaves against its anchor. I am that chosen raven delivered amongst this flock of prized pigeons. I am the bunker coal tossed at the shiny people hurling, hurling threats at us. Mine the salt sprinkled into your salinity. Mine the blood spilled clawing, grasping at land's edge, where salt water encounters sweet water and mingles with melting icebergs. Here, fresh water numbs the returning salmon until they bump into objects and offer up their bounty, gathering strength for the next assault. 
The second poem is about our, it takes its title from the, uh, the, the title of our airport. It's called Why We Are, and I'm asking why we are. <laughs> <laughs> and this poem is dedicated to Robert Duzanski, whose last desperate act of defiance was brandishing a stapler at the arresting police officers. Why we are here at the portals of arrivals. The poem is divided into two parts, arrival departures. Like in a hospital, you have obstetrics, people coming in, and palliative, where people are leaving. <laughs> and the airport is like a general hospital. Why we are here at the portals of arrival. At this first portal, we enter into an imminent penumbral world, yet our exhalation is held in check. The future will not be born if the current world is not receptive. No heralds announce our arrivals. There are no vacant concavities into which we can be extruded. Gasping, clamoring, blue in the face, arriving only at this, our moment of birth in panic mode. And why, are we here, why we are here at the portal of departures? We may have arrived alone, but here we emerge at the other end, only to slip away unnoticed, but escorted, handcuffed, branded, invisible barriers ensuring the two ends never meet. And whatever happens to us in the internum will always take, pl take place behind tinted glass. A billion ships of Theseus. So, <clears throat> what compels every seventh person you meet to abandon their home and join the jostling billion to whom only denied shores beckon? Every refugee, migrant, asylum seeker is a veritable ship of Theseus, suspended between hearth and a destination that is not home quite yet. What do we know about this seventh person thundering out to show mud-smeared, hearthless, ears ringing with the familiar, tired, generational arguments, pockets stuffed with ashes of ancestors. The ground shifts underfoot, and our armadas begin chanting every delivering tide. And here, amongst abandoned harvest fields, and now I'm talking about Zahu, Iraq, under Saddam Hussein during the Gulf War. And here, amongst abandoned harvest fields, freshly mined nocturnally, how quickly migratory herds have learned to feed on hoof while testing the integrity of barbed wires with every savage tongue. Just last week, two stowaways casually tumbled out of an astonished English sky to land on airport rooftop in snapshot rigor mortis. Another spilled from an unclaimed suitcase navigating an arrival's baggage carousel, and this happened in London about 15 years ago. Perhaps we are all such unclaimed baggage, endlessly circling global carousels. We are unclaimed baggage. This is another colonial moment. This one is set in early 17th century when the colonials occupied our land. Encountering terra nullius. Terra nullius is land, unknown land. Embarking from one wet, compulsive, wind-swept and isolated isle, you came armed with the unshakable faith in your musket, sail, book, thought, color, and all that you traversed, land, streams, rivers, seas, oceans. I have a few minutes. Okay. 
land streams, rivers, seas, oceans were immediately stripped of their original people, names, histories and rendered terra nullius, no man lands, awaiting your christening and celebrating your various inbred monarchies. You proceeded to circle the globe, calling it your personal granary. You planted nothing, yet harvested endlessly in every season, with such ferocious, unfathomable greed that the scorched lands groaned, our sea has run out. With your pantries overflowing and your armories bristling, the bully with the stick now set out to civilize the rest of the world. The flow of winds, the fate of tides would deliver you to my shores where we were too polite to reject your offer of cheap trinkets and welcomed you with open arms. Our ensuing home invasion would last a hundred thousand nights. We are still trying to awaken from your unleashed nightmare. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tariq, for treating us to such beautiful lyricism. Um, was that from uh, your new poetry collection? Ah, so Exit Wounds is to be published uh, by Caitlin Press on September 16th, 2022. What a delight. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, in the interest of time, I want to make sure that we fit in our, uh, our last segment, and then we'll have a slightly shortened uh, opportunity for some Q&A, um, but no doubt robust and, and uh, deep as well. But I wanted to now introduce Patara McKean. Uh, he was completing his second graduate degree in the Department of Sociology at UBC. Uh, he's a manager with PCHC and has been a leader and mentor in the oral history documentation efforts of the organization. Recently awarded a MyTax grant and a prov province of BC multiculturalism and anti-racism grant for the exciting community-engaged project Unearthing Hidden Stories on and Off Commercial Drive, Batara will showcase a recent video and speak on the process of capturing a community's oral stories. Unearthing Hidden Stories on and Off Commercial Drive is a project that, that builds on Pacific Canada Heritage Centre and the Museum of Migration's Banquet of Stories 2021 focuses on culturally specific food establishments in the Commercial Drive area. Our aim is to mentor young people and help them discover and document the vibrant and diverse but fast disappearing history of cultural food assets and heritage businesses run by immigrants in this working class neighborhood. My name is Matra and I'm on the drive right now. So we're capturing gorgeous Ethiopian cuisine, one of the most famous restaurants on the drive with amazing, delicious food. Let's go inside and find out more about it. Hi, Akko. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us the history behind the Guijo restaurant here? Hey, yeah, my name is Ad Kalt, and uh, uh, so I opened this restaurant uh, 10 years ago, which is I got it from another friend, so it's about total 16 years. So, uh, yeah, this restaurant is st started as a, a Ethiopian cuisine. Ethiopian food is just has to be introduced for the world because this is really, uh, we, most, uh, we mostly use uh, organic uh, spices in here. So in that way, we, we try to introduce the uh, Ethiopian food in, in, in Canada. Uh, so we are so far, we are doing good. And uh, uh, it's, it's all Ethiopian food is most stuff is cooking up front and mostly fresh and uh, uh, organic stuff we use. Well, I kind of wonder what is the motivation behind starting this restaurant 10 years ago? Yeah, just uh, several things, because just uh, my background is I'm a journalist, so my background is journalism, so uh, uh, since I came here, I see different kind of works, and uh, uh, when I was back home, uh, my grandma, she owned restaurants, she was doing business in that, in that way, so uh, that thing's clicking me uh, when I came here, I do just promotion things, uh, through that I do uh, the food uh, uh, business in the, in the side of the promotion of the concert and uh, kind of music uh, concert kind of things I used to do. Uh, since then, just I uh, switched to the business just as a restaurant business to introduce my culture 
and uh, this amazing project. So can you tell me more about this? Where, where... This is just uh, uh, the, the coffee ceremony. Everything uh, you can see here, there is a charcoal here. They roasted the coffee in here, you know, in front of the neighbors or the people who is around. And they roast it here, and then uh, they, uh, they ground it in this area. In this area. And uh, they put it on, on, on the pot. This is, we call it javan. And then we call this one a sunny. Uh, and then this is the, uh, the holder, this uh, is just a rakab, what we call it. And then in the ceremony, you see uh, a popcorn here. They do it in here, mm -hmm. in, in front of the people. It's a French. We have a French, yeah. And then uh, we have a, a, a scent, incense in here. Uh, that is just uh, to change the smell of the, the area. And the same thing, the coffee roasting is, uh, smells really good because it's spray. You will see uh, a phone. And we have snack here. The people, when they come, just before the coffee, they got the snack. Uh, everybody got a snack, and then they uh, can continue to drink the coffee. Wow! Oh. It smells really good. Thank you. Atko, the food looks amazing. I also wonder what were some of the challenges that you faced as an immigrant and also as a business owner here? Well, there is a uh, different kind of challenge in this business, especially in restaurant business, uh, when you come with a uh, different culture uh, style of uh, uh, cuisine. Especially when uh, just the eating system is really challenging here, just because we use hand, not, not fork or spoon. Uh, rather than that, to introduce ourselves in the area, uh, just uh, partially. Partially we are good because Vancouver is a diverse uh, city. People want to try everything new. Uh, they want to know everything. That helps us, uh, but not as uh, we deserve or as we uh, work hard. Uh, but for now, we are doing good. But the challenge, the main challenge is just, just especially in the area uh, the main challenge is just introduce new things for the people. Okay, so I'm gonna try and tell me if I'm eating it correct. So, how do you eat it? Just like this? Yes. Then mm -hmm. put it... like a There's a lot to learn and explore at this restaurant. So at the moment, PCHC functions uh, as a museum without walls. It doesn't have a physical space. And the aim of PCHC and its many different projects is to mentor young people uh, and help them document these vibrant stories in Vancouver and beyond. Uh, one ongoing oral history project uh, is unearthing hidden stories on and off commercial drive. Now, what that project does is describes the intergenerational and intercultural initiatives growing organically out of PCHC MOM's Banquet of Stories 2021. So, uh, some neighborhoods here in Vancouver, as you know, have a strong representation of Indigenous, Black, and people of color. And now, often, they have stories that reflect their ethnic origins, of the inhabitants of these neighborhoods. So many of these stories are misunderstood by Canadians that have not listened to them previously. So to destigmatize these experiences, it's important to help the broader public uh, understand these stories by explaining their origins and the people uh, that create them. Uh, in particular, PCHC has found storytelling to be a great way to support the documentation of oral histories and help Canadians overcome their unfamiliarity with them. Uh, so PCHC employs uh, the so-called digital uh, story process to reduce the barriers to storytelling in Vancouver uh, by producing and showcasing uh, storytellers from the community in videos. Uh, the storytelling is done through different videos and graphics created by the volunteers here at PCHC MOM, um, who we call PCHC MOM ambassadors. And they are posted on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and on the PCHC MOM website. 
to help Canadians understand that we all have stories of migration. So uh, volunteers for PCHCMOM, uh, called PCHCMOM ambassadors, they're either working adults or undergraduate students uh, or graduate students at the University of British Columbia and in all the different academic institutions here in BC and beyond. And they must balance their commitments to their jobs, studies, and research with the opportunity here to volunteer and be mentored uh, and build networks um, in the community. Uh, one important aspect uh, is the uh, archival process. So as most people here may know, archives are these institutional repositories. They're places with documents where you can go to and uh, maybe understand history uh, a bit better. But uh, the process PCHC uh, investigates and tries to make sense of is uh, these archives out there in the community. These could be in cardboard boxes, you know, shoe boxes. They can be in photograph albums. Uh, and in our world where technology has become so important, this gives us an advantage. The digital storytelling process helps us capture uh, these stories in the community. So for the commercial drive project that you just saw, our goal is to produce several videos over the next year. We'll be working with culturally specific food establishments on and off the drive. Um, and our PCHC ambassadors, of course, are from uh, all over the world. And it's important to capture these stories now and document them before they're lost. In addition, uh, PCHC MOM is looking to restore these stories and build a more inclusive understanding of the history of Canada. Thank you. Thank you um, for your leadership and mentorship always. Um, I love the work of this particular project partly because uh, I've lived off the drive for 29 years. I just moved last year and I didn't know how much I took it for granted. You know, it's kind of you're in your own backyard, but there are so many, there's reasons why my parents moved here and there's reasons why, you know, there's certain neighborhoods that call to us. Uh, and then, you know, I moved last year and I realized how much I missed. Uh, and so documenting these stories is fantastic. And of course, food is such a wonderful way uh, to connect us across, you know, imagined barriers. Um, so thank you for all your work, Batara. I, I'd actually like to invite all of the speakers up to these wonderful Italian tub chairs. <laughs> um, we don't have too much time left, but I did want to give an opportunity to at least um, you know, stretch a thread through some of the stories that we've heard today, uh, uh, as well as uh, address any questions, share any thoughts that you had. Um, this is usually kind of one of my favorite parts. So uh, I will open it up to the floor, and then I will move that and detach the mic, and we can pass that around if you had any questions for specific speakers. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and thanks, Katra. Um, I think it just also highlights how um, we hear about things halfway across the world through certain channels, you know, and, um, and we form an impression and we fill in the gaps. So having you here to speak about your experience, uh, your lived experience is very, very important and it allows us to understand that um, what we often see in media is much more fleshed out in real life. Um, so it's a great question, and then also, yeah, thank you for taking the time to answer that. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Yes, yes, Andy. Oh, sorry, Andy, and then yes. Quinn, mm. um, Quinn, can you talk about your early life in Canada when you and your mom arrived? What was uh, what was it like? How did, how did you live? What were your experiences? Okay, so I'm going to try to be short. <laughs> uh, Honestly, I found like I was like, um, if you imagine like George of the jungle. Uh, I didn't know how to use fork. I didn't know how to use knife. Even I didn't know how to use, I had to wear boots. I wear one of those boots that have Velcro clothes. 
but I, I wore them like wrong foot. So then they, they touch each other. So when I walked in the airport, they make sound. And then, so, so basically, it, I was totally, uh, I just felt really lost. Um, kind of like, almost like a deaf blind person because I couldn't see, you know, when you, uh, when you can see, you can see like uh, body language, you can do sign language, try to communicate yourself when you don't speak the English, right? So, uh, but, so I, felt, I felt really lost and I was in a residential school uh, speaking English all the time. But fortunately, uh, I went to school for the blind and they were really good to me. And that was one of the best things that did really helped me to enhance self-esteem. And I learned a lot of uh, ways to be independent, like learn to cook, learn to do things as a blind person, ski and snowboard. And what else did I do? You know, like all kinds of things in that school. So that was really good. Uh, yeah, so that was a, a big adjustment. And when I landed, it was, um, you know, minus 20 degrees Celsius in Ontario. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to stop here for now. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. No Thank you. And I think we had a question over here as well. Yes. Sorry. I felt that you had a few immigration experiences and even some very experiences. I don't know if I've tried it correctly. So can you share more of your experience? Um, I come from Punjab, and then from Punjab, I migrated to Kuwait to make a living so that uh, I could pull my family out of the troubles we were having back home due to financial constraints and all that. Because my father had been in Kuwait, it was easier for me to complete my education and then go to Kuwait, um, make a living, make, save enough money, and then move to the West, which I did was to come to Canada. So it enabled me to do this. But meanwhile, we had to go through three wars. We are, I've written in the introduction that we are, we have gone through all these remarkable things, but they are very ordinary compared to what other immigrants have to go through. We were refugees from two different nations, which is my wife from Kampala was a refugee from Uganda. We were from Kuwait when the Gulf War took place. I went through two wars, which were Pakistan and India, and then the Gulf War. So it's just, and then we have lived in three countries. We have lived in actually four countries because she's come from Uganda. So it's, it's not a very special life for me. It's what most uh, immigrants endure in order to get here. Once we see them here, we don't realize what they've gone through, the life experience, the traumas, which is why I've called my book Exit Wounds, because each immigration, each exit is a trauma. And you carry this wound with you throughout your life. So for me, a form of therapy is to write poetry. And it also helps me to talk to people because I personalize it. I avoid abstractions and I personalize history, my history, the history of my people, of the continent, through personal experiences. It really highlights the perspective. I mean, I was born here. <laughs> and uh, it's, to me, all the journeys that you've gone through, they really, um, they remind me about how fortunate I am. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the sacrifices that my parents made and grandparents made. And so thank you for that reminder. Um, I wanted to hear from Patara. Patara, this commercial drive project, and you've mentored these young ambassadors, you've done a fabulous job, and many of them are here today, and you know, you've captured the story of uh, the, the, the original, you know, first, the First Nations, obviously, but then the early Italian immigrants that were here, and then to the most recent uh, African immigrants that have come. What was it like as young people to hear these stories and to collect them, and mm -hmm. to talk about that a bit? Uh, the storytelling process is always a very unique experience um, and uh, when you're going through it uh, and you're being mentored and mentoring young people I think you're learning a lot so uh, you're always discovering something new especially with people that have such uh, deep experiences um, and uh, in this area the commercial drive area 
um, not only are you learning about these stories, uh, you're also uh, eating the different types of food um, which are connecting people from different uh, backgrounds. I think one of the most interesting things about doing the storytelling project uh, with the great volunteers that we have, the ambassadors, um, is, uh, you know, you can have Italian food and Ethiopian food, but you can still find the connection between the two uh, because of the deep histories, uh, not only of both countries, but of the peoples from those countries. Um, and so it, it is always a, uh, an exploration, I think. Um, and we're still, the project is still ongoing, so we're still capturing stories. Uh, and we're still out there in the field, so maybe you'll even see us if you're in the commercial drive area. Um, what compelled you to share the story about your um, husband's family, uh, his, your father-in-law? Um, uh, because, uh, sorry, am I capturing that correctly? I was a little bit distracted by the lights, yes. Well, I guess I'm the very forthcoming person, and I'm a very social person. Mm -hmm. And I, when I married, I had no idea what the background was. And both Mary and Fred were very, very tight-lipped. And um, even when I'd go visit uh, and be in the kitchen with Mary, there wasn't the openness that was like my family, which were Irish, so wild parties, but <laughs> Calm, calm. But um, just, I, I guess this is sort of a funny example, and I don't mean to downplay anything, but I worked and put Mario through university. And when we came back to Vancouver, because I had always worked, I told him, I says, well, I'm still going to work. Now in those days, and the wife usually stayed home, but I had a very good husband. So then, uh, he was, he was. And so I said to him, I, this is going to sound terrible. <laughs> I said to him, I said, well, I'm as smart as you are. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know that we can't afford for me to go to UBC or whatever. So I said, what I'll do is I'll go to night school. So I worked full time. I went to night school two nights a week for five years, and I had two babies in that time. Oh my God. But my husband was extremely good, as I said, and he shared everything housework, taking care of the kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, when he graduated from university, I had a really neat party for him. When I graduated from my studies, I didn't even get a card <laughs> from his side of the family. It's always been in my heart, that little tiny bit of bone of contention. <laughs> but learning more about the family's humiliation, their close-knit communication amongst a few friends, I gradually got used to the idea of why we didn't celebrate what I had accomplished. And this is really the first time I've talked about it, I'm being honest. And even his sister, because of her upbringing in her family, she didn't have that type of giving, although she's a very good woman. Um, it was ignored, you know, my accomplishments were ignored. So I had to learn mm -hmm. that their lives weren't like my life, and I had to balance that out, which I did. And we were a very close-knit um, group of people uh, throughout our lives. Does that answer that a bit? It does sound like um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I'll write you a card. <laughs> I'll write you a card. But also, just how important that relationship building is. That, and that I see that with Patara and the youth ambassadors when they reach out. Because how do you go out to a restaurant, a stranger, and say, tell me your story? Mm -hmm. But even today, um, you have all gifted us with your stories. And, you know, um, I really feel how precious, you know, we talked about those precious moments, this opportunity to gather. Um, there's a Japanese saying for it, Ichigo Ichie. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but it's that... It's the fleetingness and the specialness and the uniqueness of each moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Quinn talked about these moments and how they can have that ripple effect. We're never going to be the same group of people in this moment witnessing these stories ever again. And that's very special. Yeah. And I worked all my life. And uh, Mario's mother, she worked most of her life also. I love so. a story about trailblazing women. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, so there's our story. Thank you so much. Can I, can we get a round of applause for our speaker concert? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'm going to close the, the um, today's event, um, but I did want you to know that we have, we have more Pacific Canada Story Fest events planned this summer, and we've got some great programs and ex uh, exhibits planned for next year and the coming years as well. Please talk to any of the PCHC team to learn how you can get involved or stay connected. Um, Check out our YouTube channel. Thank you, P-C-H-C-M-O-M. -M. Uh, and thank you so much for giving us those extra 15 minutes. And I hope you have a wonderful evening planned. Um, thank you all so much. Yeah, take care. <laughs>